Walt Disney. Walt Disney had a really, really nice creative strategy that draws together everything that I've been talking about this morning. He didn't know he was doing NLP, because NLP doesn't really exist. It's just a way of understanding people. He had a really nice creative strategy for developing things. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk you through the process, and then I'm actually going to give you a couple of minutes each just to sit down and give it a go. Yeah? And you're going to have to stand up and move around a little bit for this one, I'm afraid, as you will see when I, uh, when I talk about it. But I just want to give you a five minutes just to try it on whilst you're here so you get the understanding of how it works. And then if you have any questions, you can ask them afterwards. So what Walt Disney did, and he was very specific about this, incidentally, is he had an office. And in that office, he had three chairs. And these three chairs, he had them in very specific situations places in the room. In fact, his cleaner wasn't allowed to move them. The person who came into the cleaning room, they, they had to be where they were. Now, talking about what I was talking about before, these chairs, yeah, he has three different chairs, and they associate to three different states. So what are those chairs to Walt Disney, talking about what I've been talking about earlier on? Well done. Have a house point. I've completely forgotten your name, but have a house point. Is it Claire? Oh, yes. <laughs> have another house point. She's catching up, Frank. Watch it. And you'll drop well behind now, I'm afraid. And the, as for the rest of you, Michael, just throw him off the course. <coughs> so we had three chairs which were anchors. And each one anchored to a different state. The dreamer, the critic, and the realist. And what he would do was he would get himself, as he sat in the chair, they triggered that anchor, which is why it's very important to have three different places to do this. Because if you do it in just one place, you don't have the power of the anchor. Yeah? So you do in three different places. His, his dream was like a really nice comfy chair. You know, sort of like a, you know, a sort of an armchair he could sit in. And he would sit down. And in the dreamer chair, he would ask himself the question, if I had infinite resources and I knew I couldn't fail, what would I do? Yeah? So he would ask himself that question. If I knew I couldn't fail and I had infinite resources available to me, what would I be doing right now? Excuse me. So he would then throw in, and he would go completely you know, wild. He would think about anything. Well, what I'd do is I'd do this, and I'd fly to Neptune, and I'd do this, that, and the other, and I'd build a hotel in the bottom of the sea, and blah, 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 blah. Go completely crazy. Yeah, total, total mental ideas. Just anything he could think of, just chuck them down on paper. And then, after about five or ten minutes of doing that, or as long as he wanted to do to sit there, he would sit down, and he would stand up, and he would move to the critic. And his critic, he would then rip into those ideas. He would take totally the counter-argument to them. You know, he'd be you know, the, the most critical person he could be. He'd really tear apart his own ideas, really nastily. You know, that is utterly stupid. That's ridiculous. How on earth am I going to achieve that? Blah, blah, blah. You know, <coughs> utterly you're completely mental. There's no way no one's going to do that. No one's going to achieve it. That's utterly stupid. You know, that sort of thing. So he would totally rip it apart. That often is the part that people find the easiest, strangely enough. And he would rip it apart. And then, when he'd have these two pieces of information, one is the dream and one's on the critic, he would go to the realist's chair... And then he would sit down and say, okay, with the information I've got available to me and the resources I know I have at the moment, what can I actually do? What can I actually do now? So he would sit down and he'd work out and say, well, that might be possible. So what I need to do is invest in some research to find out if it's going to work or not. Yeah, so we go off and research it. He'd look at something and go, well, that's not possible right now, but it could be possible in the future. So I'll put that idea to one side and revisit it in six months, 12 months. You know, all that I can actually do right now, right away. That's something we can get working on. I've got my team to start doing it. So he would then develop, essentially, a task list or a to-do list. Yeah, a project list, a process list. And then he might leave it at that and go off and carry on with his day. Or he might then, with that realist information of what he's developed, have two or three maybe projects he's thought of you might then go back to the dreamer chair and go crazy with those three projects again. You pick the one and really dream about it and think, oh, if I took this to its logical conclusion or its illogical conclusion, what can I achieve from it? Yeah, and then you might go back to the critic chair. And he could do this round and round and round. And I've applied this. I've taught this to all sorts of people and I've applied it myself. And it's an incredibly powerful tool to develop creativity by getting yourself in the right mental state. Yeah. Getting the structure right, you know, visualising it, getting the right images, balancing your senses, and then asking the right questions in the right context, in the right situation, you find that it develops creativity. And not only will it create, develop creativity in this quite specific ritualistic process, you find if you do it on a regular basis, you naturally start to do this with everything you're given. 
going back to the Malcolm Gladwell book, the Blink book, yeah, it goes back. So you naturally start becoming more creative.